what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm going to introduce formally Ron Sheth in a second of GrowRev.com. Ron, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out. And since, you know, doing research on Ron, he is a student and geeks out on direct response marketing, I think, like me. Um, and I think the foundation for me in, in business is 80-20 meets direct response. So I love, check out the interviews I did with Perry Marshall. There's two of them. You know, he wrote the 80-20 sales and marketing um, direct response interviews. Um, Brian Kurtz, Stefan Georgie, uh, Justin Goff. Those are all good ones. Ron Paul Peel, actually. Yeah. Um, Ron Paul Peel, may he rest in peace. He died recently, but there's an amazing interview with Ron Paul Peel. Um, and the story is, Ron, when I was talking to him, he, he just was like, Jeremy, can we just do audio? I'm like, with all due respect, Mr. Paul Peel, you are the king of infomercials. We are doing video for this. So he ended up doing video. I'm glad we did. Yeah. So that and many more, check out inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And I've been podcasting for over a decade. And you know, there's no better way that I have found to give to my relationships, to profile the people and the companies I admire, have them on the podcast, share with the universe what they do. So if you, I've been saying this for over a decade, by the way, before people were like, oh, what's a podcast? You know, they're saying, what's a podcast? Every business should have a podcast, in my opinion. If you um, have questions, go to rise25.com, email us. We're happy to answer anything and anything that you want. And today's guest, I am very excited. Uh, Rohan Sheth is co-founder of growrev.com. They've handled over $100 million in ad spend for thousands of companies, resulting in over $600 million in return. His sales journey began in high school when he began importing pocket bikes, selling to his friends, cut his teeth on you know, $13,000 education packages door to door. And if you want to grow hair in your chest, Rohan, I think <laughs> you go door to door and you sell, okay? Yeah. That, it takes some some chops to go in and there's just so much mindset wise that it takes to overcome rejection after rejection after rejection. So um, he founded GrowRev with Matt Farmer. Um, he's worked with companies like ClickFunnels, Tony Robbins, Dean Graziosi, and many more. Ron, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. You've, made, you've had some weapons in this industry on this podcast already. So some great names. People Who are your favorites in direct response? Um, well, I came from the direct sales world. And when I transitioned into direct response, the two people single-handedly that I credit my entire journey is Jay Abraham and uh, Dan Kennedy. Those are the two that I give all of my credit to. Dan, the yeah. godfathers. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So, I love it. And, and Jay and Jay now, fortunately, has become a very close friend um, over the years of you know getting to this point. So grateful for that transition. What were you studying? I remember ordering the magnetic marketing audio cassette tapes. <laughs> From Dan Kennedy, what was some of the stuff that uh, did you go to this, the conferences or did you get the materials or? No. Um, what was the very first thing? It was a J. So the very first thing that got me into marketing was I was doing door to door sales and I did in home sales, like you've already kind of uh, brought up in here. And I just got really bored. Right. And I was like, okay, I got good at it. And I'm like, hey, what's next? Because I've mastered the art of one to one. I wanted to understand more to many, understood marketing. And doing research, and then I literally went into a thrift into like a thrift store one day, and I was just looking at books. I always like going to the thrift store for books because you find some gems in there that people just get rid of that are worth bucks, and I love books. And I found this book with uh, Jay Abraham, and he co-authored it with somebody else. Big blue book, and I still have it. I can't remember the exact name. And it's essentially where he went through and like gave different ideas for a bunch of different businesses. I think it was like over 150 different businesses. And I'm reading this book, and I'm like, this is genius. Like this is literally my sales brains going into this. And then I started to look up Jay Abraham and I started to look up all of his content. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to another was like the ultimate sales letter, I think with Dan Kennedy and then all of the no BS books and what, like it just spiraled. And then from there, I was like, this is my industry and this is where I belong. And then that's kind of how I started and kind of got into it. I love it. 
as you've gotten yeah. to know Jay Abraham, what are some of the lessons you remember from him? The, the big thing, like Jay's known for is like, you know, uh, relationship capital, but like, how do you get, take that relationship capital and turn it into JVs and finding unique opportunities to turn, you know, one stream of income into multiple streams of income. Um, that is something that I've learned very, very closely from Jay. Cause every single time we jump on, even just a catch up call, he's always like, how can I help you? And where can I find you more money? <laughs> like that's kind of essentially his USP. Cause like, I'll explain to him a deal. He's like, what about this? Or what about that? And he just thinks so out of the box. That is so inspiring to see because, you know, we're so in, in our day to day, so um, ingrained in kind of just a one directional thinking that he's always like looking at different ways. It's such as just adding more value to a business. I have heard, I don't know what's accurate or not, that, you know, some of his mentors or his, the, his mentees include like Damon John and Tony Robbins and some of those people that look to him and ask him for advice. Yeah, Damon, uh, Damon, I know Damon and Jay are really good friends. I know Jay speaks on Tony's stage as well for business mastery. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of close, you know, connects in terms of third party uh, connections and relationships there. So it's been a phenomenal, it's been a phenomenal one. So sure. speaking of Tony Robbins, you've done work for Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi. What can you talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you work with them on? Um, with them, obviously we have zero interaction directly with Tony, um, just because at the end of the day, his brand is so tight knit. We work directly through their team. Um, so we run all of the traffic, uh, for mastermind.com, which is Dean Graziosi and Tony Robbins' company. So anything that you see from mastermind.com, um, is us in terms of Facebook ads, YouTube ads, et cetera. And some of the opportunities that we've had is just like, you know, running some big, massive scaled events. Like we came from the event world, right? And, you know, you're running events for, like we ran a lot of the events where you've seen like the Shark Tank guys, like Kevin O'Leary, Robert Hershevik, all of those guys, they have an attractor factor. But then you put someone like Dean and Tony or true direct response marketers behind an event and they just command a crowd. That's just insane, right? There's one that we did this year. I think we broke a million registrations uh, for that one specific five day event. We brought in and went out and did some pretty unique marketing styles. We brought in influencers to push it. We did our typical ads and kind of, you know, leverage everything that we can in terms of uh, creating that end user or buyer that they were looking for to kind of bring it and scale it up. Um, do you, with the influencers, do you help put that together for them or are you reaching out or are they kind of bringing them to you? No, we, we reach out to influencers. Um, I had a company that was very, very focused on the influencer marketing world. So I've got a lot of close relationships because of that. Um, and you know, one of the things that I had at a aha moment last year was during Q4, um, Q, end of Q3 going into Q4 when all the e-commerce companies, like I couldn't go on YouTube without like just e-commerce product, e-commerce product, e-commerce product, just ramming me with watching YouTube videos in terms of ads with some of these influencers. And I'm like, if these guys are paying money for e-commerce sale, majority of direct response is usually a free front end. And all they need is a list bill and they, they can understand leveraging it. And then we started to roll that out this year with our clients and the numbers have been insane. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really hard ask or a really hard, um, well, I wouldn't say ask, but it's a conversation to have with people when they're used to spending $1 in and getting you know, at least $1 out immediately. Whereas an influencer, you could be paying, you know, $30,000, $40,000 upfront for, for an ad in a video. And most people don't realize like $30,000, $40,000 is a lot. But the one thing they don't realize is specifically on YouTube, not only are you going to get that influx of that very first video within the 36 to 48 hours of depending how well the influencer does, but that video continually gets views week over week, month it's over month, year over year. Yeah, yeah, it's evergreen. And it's like once they can they put that correlation and click that in their head together, then that thirty, forty thousand dollars to them is like now they're buying LTV and like starting to do that. And you know, now a lot of people are starting to actually understand why I'm so bullish on influencers. Well, also part of it is you probably make it go even further with running traffic to it, right? Yeah. Not just well, you know, assuming they just make a post, right? Yeah, no, we, we'll take the ad. Um, so whatever the ad that like, we negotiate for the client is one of the things we put into the, our contract is, you know, whatever you shoot as an ad, we're allowed to run on our page, targeting your audience as an ad specifically. Um, you know, some of them have time limits to them. Some of them don't really care because they know they're still getting views and it's still getting their channel notoriety. But uh, so we take what we're, you know, most companies would just use as a, ad inside of an influencer video, we're taking in and running at additional ad traffic on top of it. Are there any types of influencers you're looking for now? Like if um, someone's like, you know what, you know, just throw it out there. If someone's listening, like, you know what, I may know the perfect influencer for you. What types are you looking for now with the type, you know, the companies you're working with? 
the one, the, the ones that I'm like, when it comes to types of influencers, I'm not really worried about specific types. Like if they're in the car space or in the fitness space or whatever, what I really look for is demographic on the type of influencer that they have. Like, are they, like if they're only focused towards kids, probably not the best uh, for me to work with them or I don't have the clients to serve them, but if they're, at least they've got an audience that's 18 and older, um, male, female, doesn't matter. I've got clients on both sides. And the number two thing that I'm looking for is watch time on their videos, because if their watch time is high, um, that means these guys is uh, subscriber base is very, very loyal and going down that route, it's become, you know, just looking broad, just thinking outside the box. Most people are looking just fitness or just cars or just food or whatever, but it's like, you know, there's people that there's, there's markets that correlate or one on top of another, like run an ad in like a book review channel. That's got your audience. Like who cares? It's the same audience. Like you're at the end of the day, that's what you're kind of going after. Matt farmer. I mentioned, um, yeah. came from doing stuff for the Olympics and big, uh, tennis tournaments. And how did you guys uh, come together? Yes. Yeah, so Matt ran a lot of the traffic for like the Olympics, Sky Sports, Tennis TV, Premier Boxing Champions, big, big event companies. That's our sporting events that he ran for. Um, him and I actually very first met um, before he was in marketing and I was ever in marketing. He used to live in a house full of door-to-door -door sales guys and was the only person that didn't do door-to-door -door there. And I did door-to-door -door with the rest of the guys. Um, so that's how I originally met Matt. And then, you know, we built a close relationship. He was living in Vancouver at the time, eventually moved back to Toronto. That's where he's from originally. And then, you know, we went our separate ways for a few years and then come back and he saw me put, I think it was like a LinkedIn article or a Facebook post where he saw me type, put up a case study that I did for a client. And he's like, messages me and he's like, what are you doing in marketing? And I'm like, why? And he's like, because I'm in marketing. And then you just one thing led to another. And we know we both know our skill sets that align very, very well. And one thing that I've always learned about partnerships is, you know, you want to partner with someone that's your weakest attribute at the end of the day. And his is, you know, like he loves the Atla buying media side. I like it. I understand it. I prefer to do sales all day long. So we're like, let's just build, build this company together, partner it up and bring both of our uh, skill sets. What were some key roles that you hired for over the years that you're like, okay, he's amazing at this. I'm amazing at sales. And you surround yourself with a team. Yeah. Um, the, so obviously Matt and I partner. So we, everything I did sales side was me. Everything on the fulfillment side was Matt. Eventually the team started like the company, the clients are thinking, or, companies started to get bigger, client demand started to increase, and then we really needed an operations person. And that was a big, big uh, part for me because like as much as we, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're just, you can run around with your chicken with your head cut off and still make it figure out. But until you get an operationally driven system, you can't build a real company. And my brother at the time was managing five different restaurants. And if you're managing five mm -hmm. different restaurants, you know, operations is the backbone of running five different restaurants. And I hadn't seen him in two years because he was just working the typical hospitality lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I literally made him an offer and I said, listen, you know, you can come work with me and I'm not, you're not going to make a lot of money to start because I got to teach you everything, but you can bring your operational skill set and then come and learn this and get all of your life back. But, you know, if you commit to three to four years with me, you'll make five times the amount of money you're making right now. And he was one of the biggest key inputs in kind of our company and everything now to a point where, you know, when we brought him on board, we made a decision, Matt and him, myself, that we would focus on fulfillment more than sales um, in terms of systems, because on the sales side, I know what I was capable of doing. And that's all we did. We, we figured out client fulfillment, so media buying and account management, built those to a point where today we can hire someone within three months to the day, they can be on their own, as long as they obviously pass through the tests and everything else. Uh, and now we're finally getting to a point where we're having to build a sales team and you know take things to a whole new level. Yeah, the restaurant industry is a brutal schedule, brutal. So talk about some of the, you, know, you mentioned the systems um, and the tools and software that you like to use internally with the team or putting that infrastructure in place. Um, well, the, thing, the, the one thing that I've learned over the years to do with running at least a digital agency specifically and looking at, you know, restaurants or, you know, when I ran, a, I was uh, a manager at McDonald's for a long, long time. Yeah. It's like, you know, how do you, I take saw the, that the most, yeah, take the for most like complicated over five years. I was right. at McDonald's for seven and I was a manager. I was one of the restaurant managers for five. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so like I was very operationally driven from that point, but I was very like my true core being as an entrepreneur. Like I just love the creativity, just go mentality. Um, and the one thing that I learned there was, you know, how do you take the most complicated process and turn it simple, but then just make it into a machine. Like at the end of the day, that's all it was. Right. And that was one of the, the key things that we did from systems and tools and everything else that we brought into the company was 
if I close a deal today or bring on a client and open that relationship, because it's like, it's not closing, essentially it's opening that relationship and I hand it over to the operations team. How does it go from operations to success case study, you know, within a certain amount of time. And we did everything that we needed to do and found every piece that we needed to get to, to that point. So like at, at a point where it is today, our entire sales team can just hand it over once the onboarding call is done. And now like we legitimately never really have to like talk to the client or have any sort of issues with it because every way, every um, step of the way, there's someone like holding their hands in the entire process. Ron, I love to hear a few of the lessons you learned uh, working uh, in McDonald's uh, as a manager. And, and for some reason, like I saw this when I was doing my research and I like don't place you in like a corporate setting. Like it just doesn't, like in my mind, it, it was hard for me to get to that point. So wh why did you even start at McDonald's? And I want to um, hear about some of the lessons. Well, I started at McDonald's because it was like the easiest job for me to get at 14, right? Like in Canada, I don't know about the states, but in Canada, you can get hired with, parent, with parental consent at 14. And my parents knew, it's like, as soon as this kid can work, he's going to go work. Like I did anything and everything just because I wanted to always work. Like just, that was my thing. So it's like, they gave me parental consent. I was able to start working and um, I just got really good at it really fast. And by the age of 17, I was in high school still and I was already a shift manager. And I remember negotiating with teachers to just let me go work full time, mark me as to be in school and, you know, just bribe them once a week with, with free McDonald's for their whole family or whatever it was. And just getting the true barter system with my school teachers and it worked uh, looking back at it and eventually, you know, got out and started to scale through the McDonald's corporate ladder going through the, you know, the McDonald's university or whatever you want to call it. Did a bunch of that. I learned a lot of business, um, you know, got a lot of business techniques from the way they did that. And what it really taught me was one, for me personally, corporate was never going to be something that I would ever be able to do. Um, I got offered multiple times. Even when I quit, they had me come back and like bribe me to nth degree to come back and become working at corporate, like just not just the restaurant base, but like the one uh, in Vancouver here. And I was like, the reason being I never took that offer at a young age, like this would have been like 1920, was I knew if I did, that was the end of my life. Golden and what I meant by that, Golden handcuffs. That's legitimately what it was going to be. They offered me a car. They offered me a credit card system. They offered me gas cards. They offered me like everything to a point where it's like a cell phone. I have to pay for nothing. I literally got to show up, do the work, go home, be going to take every single dollar I make and put it in my pocket. And I was like, yeah, that's great. It's great to do that at 20 and you know, everybody be so stoked, my family and everything else. But I'm like, it's just not me. Yeah. Not me. I'm I totally student. hear that. You know, I went to visit a friend, you know, I'm in Chicago and uh, we went to, I went, the works at LinkedIn. Uh, we went to LinkedIn yeah. headquarters and I went there and they had a full floor of private chef, breakfast, lunch, dinner. I would like, if I have started here, I would never leave. I mean, it, it, so I totally get what you're saying. <laughs> it would be the, the golden hand. It's like, wait, why would I leave here? Um, yeah. But you had that hunger and it kind of talk about the lessons that you learned from your parents because they were your your dad was an entrepreneur yeah my dad so i grew up in india until i was 11 before moving to canada um and i grew up in a very interesting uh background or lifestyle whichever way you want to call it um my family owned a very large travel agency in india to a point where at one point they owned an airline it was one of the fastest growing companies at one point in india and I literally grew up in, you know, I only traveled first class. I only stayed in nice hotels, had maids, had drivers, like you name it. That's kind of the lifestyle that I grew up in. So I'm like, I grew up and I'm like, what is life? Like I didn't know any other, anything else. So I moved to Canada. And um, my dad and his brother had a disagreement. They went their own separate ways. And then eventually my dad went on his own to kind of build his company. And I just kind of saw that, you know, what it's like to build and kind of go from scratch and have everything to having nothing to having everything again kind of situation. And that entire um, process or journey was something that stuck with me at a very young age. And I was just like, you know, it was cool because it's like I had this life and then I came to Canada and I had nothing, like legitimately nothing. And then I'm like, I want that again. And like, but I was like, everything that I could correlate back to wanting that again was business. And that was one of the reasons why I think having that entrepreneur bone kind of just stuck with me. It's like every single time I couldn't get anything when I lived in Canada at a young age and my parents did anything and everything they could. But, you know, there's sometimes you're asking for certain things or it's like, it just wasn't feasible at that time. And I'm like, well, we never had this issue then. We never had this issue then. Like, that's kind of the story I kept telling myself in the head. And like that story was, all right, well, I'm just going to go on my own and build my own company eventually one day. What was it like moving 
I mean, I can't imagine at that age going to a totally foreign country. What was it like going from India to Canada? It was a culture shock um, for sure, because, you know, I come from an environment like let's just talk about school, right? In India, you're in school, you're it's it, you're literally book smart, book smart, book smart. Like, you're li- like all I remember was, you know, you wake up, go to school, then go and do tutoring for different subjects, depending on what you are, go home, do your homework, go to sleep, do it all over again. Like, that was just like one aspect of my life. And you come to Canada where it's like academics is there, but it's like they put a lot more emphasis on, you know, on PE and, um, you know, street smart stuff, like stuff that didn't really matter. And in India, if you're not in like the 98th percentile of your class, you're essentially considered a dumb kid. Whereas like over here, they're like, yeah, whatever. And I just, like seeing that and like, I, that was kind of what I grew up in. It's like, I understood how to study. But then when I came to Canada and I started to realize, you know, there's also street smarts versus book smarts. And I was a very resourceful kid even back when we lived in India. I was like, this is more my lifestyle. It took about, I don't know, what, uh, when I moved here, it was grade six to about grade nine to really figure out, you know, w- like where my footing was and kind of like how I was going to build this entire life of mine in a new country. And then grade nine, grade 10 came along and then, you know, grade nine, 10, I'm working at McDonald's. And then that was just an entire 180 in my life. And things just went a different way. You know, we talked a little bit before we hit record on during COVID and your clients uh, trusted you to go, okay, things are shutting down. Um, You know, should we just put the brakes on or not? Uh, So talk about what you advised and what you did with them. Um, Yeah, so I was in a very interesting situation when COVID happened because within six weeks of the beginning, so I had my, my first daughter like February of last year, and then, COVID, and then, you know, COVID's building up. And then my dad passes the same oh, day. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So I came back. Appreciate that. I came back from that entire situation to a company just in like, have a, like people don't know what the heck's going on because I had to take some time off and do with family and all that good stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, what's going on? Like this clients that have left. Great. We can't do anything about that. Everybody freaked out. No one really knew what was going on. There was a handful of clients that I know were waiting for me to come back before they really made a proper decision on whether to shut down, whether to not. I know they cut their ad spend down, everything else. And I jumped on a call with every single one of them. And I said, listen, whatever your offer is right now, we're going to put 180 every single thing. And we're going to go, now we're going to the point where we got to get your attention out there. You're still going to spend money on ads. I'm going to hook you up with a discount. We're not going to charge you. So it's like we had to kind of reverse engineer it. But majority of them that actually listen, and one specific story that I'll tell you in a second here, he fought me tooth and nail to literally just go like, no, I'm shutting my office down. I'm just going to call the banks and put a pause on my lease. Like literally he was going to go all out and just shut down because he didn't know what was going to happen. He was in the real estate investment world. He's like, who's it, who is going to invest in real estate during when no one's even working? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, it's not who's going to invest now, but who's going to invest when everything opened back up because we're going to go through this phase and no one really knew it, but it's like human psychology one-on-one, you know, when someone gets taken away from something, they want to do it 10 times harder on the other side when they get given it again. Like, that's all I could keep telling myself was like, just figure out what the opposite is in every single thing that I look at. And, and I'm like, how about this? I'm not going to charge you to do this, but you're also not going to tell me that if I double your income before the end of the year, you're going to pay me double what you would pay me. And I'm like, that's a bet that I'm willing to take. Like myself. you're a good and sales like, guy, Ron. Yeah. You're a good sales like, guy. <laughs> legitimately. Take the risk so he's out. Like, okay, fine. So, yeah. Yeah, I took all the risk out, put all the risk in my in my hands. But it's like I knew in my head, I'm like, if this guy just listens and let us do what we need to do, we'll come out on the other side and win. And literally, he was selling a fifteen thousand dollar real estate investment offer, where it's like he teach people how to invest in real estate, and then eventually put them in a home and kind of build their portfolio and kind of scale the entire process up. I said that entire fifteen thousand dollar offer that you charge people for, you're going to give it away for free for the next ninety days, and that's all you're going to do. And your entire USP. Is I'm not taking clients on. I'm doing this to give you guys an education that I charge people for. And every single video you do is a, you're going to close it out. But I hope you got a ton of video. I want you guys to all understand that we're not taking clients on right now. This is just to educate you. He said he had a bigger list of buyers that wanted the rest of his offers within that 90 days than he ever had prior to COVID going into that realm because he just kept giving away so much value and telling people that he was not going to become take on clients. That people were just emailing him and offering him more to, to be able to put him under their wing and teach him real estate investing. And at the end of the day, you know, that was a story that came out. And today this guy will like anything I tell him to do now, he just listens, doesn't even question it, just straight up listens. 
And I was like, that, that was, that one felt good because, you know, he waited till I got back from my craziness in my life. And then still I had to go even more crazier with him to, you know, to challenge him on the other end. And then he still won. And majority of our clients that, you know, anyone that we pivoted, every single, actually every single one that we pivoted won and did better in 2020 than they did even in 2019, because it was just going from, you know, charging up front to value first. Really. You know, in that moment, there's a lot, I think that's taken for granted with your training of doing door-to-door sales, you know, in that conversation, um, talk about what you learned, um, you know, crafting or removing objections or, you know, crafting a sales pitch. Cause in that moment, you, your natural ability, not even natural, but your learned practice ability took over and you were able to turn that around and create that situation where you had the opportunity to provide value for this person where most people would maybe not have handled it like that. Do you know what I mean? So talk about some of the lessons of crafting a pitch or removing objections, just sales of what you've learned in sales. Yeah. So it's funny because I came from a world where, you know, I did door to door sales to take you out for a week and like learn the script, learn the script, learn the script, then go do the script. And then I went to in-home selling and it was a 24 page booklet. And I still have this booklet. You, and you were not allowed to go sell until you knew every word, word for word. If you made a mistake, you had to go and do the test all over again, right from the beginning. And then I get to a point where it's at today. And, you know, even my sales guys like, do we have a script? And I go, no, you don't have a script. I just give them like literally baseline, figure out what the problem is, figure out what they need. How can we solve that problem and create an offer? And that's literally what it comes down to. And, you know, and then I give them a lot of my recordings and I just say, go study the recordings. And like, that's kind of my way of doing it. So for me, it really has come down to understanding really what the person's dealing with in that moment, because every single person, and it's, this is one-to-one. Now, if we're having a conversation and selling one-to-many off of the stage, very different, very different process. Now, but it's like, you know, it's like in that moment, what are they struggling with? And objections only come when you haven't answered what they're really dealing with. And one of the things that even one of the guys that does sales with me now, like, and him and I built, built the last company we worked together and did majority of the sales is like, I've noticed like people don't have objections at the end of the call with you. And if they do, it's just like minor ones where it's like, you know, how do you get started? Why do you guys take so? Why is there a 14 day onboarding process? Like those little ones were just an operationally driven thing. But it's like, what you've really done is you've just gotten to the point of understanding the root cause and then just giving them a fix to the root cause. And that's where, you know, at the end of the day, how do you create more like, money in your life? Just find a problem, fix it, charge for it. I mean, that's legitimately what it comes down to. Um, so in a situation like this was, you know, the emotional um, intelligence that really comes from understanding what humans are going through and putting that to play with doing door-to-door sales and in-home sales helped for sure. But I will never look at someone in, ter- in terms of, you know, teaching them how to do it from a script probably the worst person to give that advice because if any other salesperson would be like, no, focus on a script. But the way I do it, very different. And there's a reason why I don't teach salespeople. You know, um, it's because I do it based on the human to human interaction, not just because I want an end outcome. I know I'm going to get that end outcome. It's how I'm going to do it. It's very different than most people would. What were some, I want to go back to the root cause in a minute, but what were some ways you got in the door with door-to-door sales? Because I'm sure you learned, you know, just through practice, different techniques. Because if you could get in, with door-to-door sales, I mean, you transition that to a webinar, transition that to direct response, whatever it is. So, what were some of the things you used uh, to get in the door, literally, um, door-to-door? But I got really good at it. Um, and to be fair, got really good at it. I went three and a half weeks without a sale, almost got fired. Like when I got, when I transitioned into door-to-door sales, and then I got a couple of sales and eventually became a top producer of the company. But eventually it was there long enough that it's like, you know, just you're like, now it's just kind of subconscious. And I learned it was an NLP book. And I can't remember what NLP book it was, an audio tape that I was reading once. And it was like the fastest way to gain someone's attention and authority and respect is to insult them. Hmm. Right. Like, and, but, it, but it comes down to the delivery on how you insult them. And that was the big part. So it's like, you know, creating <laughs> you're going to someone's door. Like your house is terrible. Yeah, no, I'm just like le- legitimately, it's like holy shit, I've seen cleaner. Like, I literally be like, holy shit, I've seen cleaner foyers before. And like, sorry, like I'm just talking about your foyer, man. Like, you probably need to get a cleaner. And then they're like, now that they, they've offended you, but then you can joke about it after. And like, as long as you can turn it around quick enough, you have their attention and you control the conversation. 
Um, there were some wicked one-liners that probably not appropriate for this podcast, to be honest, that I would use all the time um, and kind of go down that route. But it's like, that's legitimately what I would do. And, mm. you know, it's like, it's very different than most salespeople, but, you know, it comes down to understanding, you know, body language, tonality, the typical basic things in, in sales, and then adding, you know, subtle things like going down. Even today, it's like, I will, like, when I'm on a sales call sometimes, and it makes my business partner laugh because he's like, I will just call a spade a spade. Like we'll be on a sales funnel. Like we'll, I'll be auditing a sales funnel. And I'll be I legitimately like the first thing. Like if it if if it's true, I'm not gonna bullshit it. Not yeah. But if it's true, I'll be like, this is the ugliest bloody thing I've ever seen. How does this convert? But it's like I've legitimately say that to them because now there's like the, now there's an authority factor that's already involved, right? And now now they're willing to listen, kind of go down that road. So it's like it just really comes down to understanding how you can do that and opening that door and controlling that conversation as fast as you can. That's amazing. So what, what would be one run that's not vulgar that you would use as a, uh, again, like this comes from a place of the way I, I sense it. It's, it's still genuine. You're not okay. making something up. It's there. It's not like you're doing it for insult purpose. It's actually legitimate, especially if you're looking at someone's business and you want to give them candid advice, it's helpful yeah. to think of, Right. So I shouldn't be afraid to maybe offend them yeah. and tell them the way it is. Um, what, what did you remember as one, maybe it's not so vulgar that you opened with that was well, the one. Uh, yeah. So the one, so when I did, so I did order door sales, then I transitioned to in-home sell, right? So when I did in-home sell, that was an interesting one. So this one is actually probably the most appropriate for, I would say your audience in terms of the way I would turn it around. So we would have a door to door sales team going out collecting leads. Then we'd have a call center that would call those leads to book an appointment to send one of us in. So there's a three step process by time. So now you got to think the, the end consumer and the families that we're talking to are so pissed off that these guys have literally been calling them for three, sometimes six months to get us in the door. So when you get there, the families are just saying yes to have us show up. And then they just want at the door, they're going to try and turn you around and get you to leave. Like that was their motto at the end of the day because they just want them to, the call center to stop. And they'd be like, you know, I get parents abusing me at the door, like legitimately, like words you've never heard of, like, like this stuff you never heard. And I just sit there and like, let them, let them let it out. I'm like, just let them let it out. And it's like, okay, want me to leave? I'm like, yes, I want you to leave. All right. Well, I want you to realize one thing I'm leaving, but this meeting was not for you. It was for your kids. So if your kids need help in school, maybe, maybe don't call us in the future. And I turn around and walk away. And then like the parents would instantly like stop and like, I'd catch them. And as I'm walking away, they're like, what do you mean? come back. And as soon as I got inside the door, it was game over. Cause I knew I had, I had authority from them. I love it. One of my friends does, uh, their company does something similar in the, in the, um, home improvement space. What I, I actually try to convince him, I want to put a GoPro on one of his salespeople yeah. that goes in the house and I want to publish it as a podcast episode. So yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to make him listen to this and convince him that, you know, we will hide identities or whatever, but I want that like authentic, real conversation um, of selling. In -house. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's funny that you say that because like when I was talking to Dirk, like the guy that is something that we built, he worked with me door to door and the in home sales company. We were talking about this recently. Now he's coming to help me build the sales team here. And I was like, imagine back when we were selling in-home sales and we had a GoPro or some sort, just being able to like watch and record the interactions that we would get into. Like that would be a YouTube channel and a podcast on its own. Like legitimately, it was wild. Like the stories of like what we would go through was insane. And he's like, yeah, he's like, back then you wouldn't even even have that. Like this is pre-YouTube when we were doing this. So it was pretty crazy. Well, now you could do it. But what do you remember the craziest, like you mentioned that, almost reversal the yeah. the sales like totally irate to sale and i don't know why like my mind goes to i don't know if you're you know uh a fan but i probably quote tommy boy maybe once a day i don't know if you ever saw the movie where he like reverses the the lady at the restaurant for the chicken wings one of my favorite scenes but what was one of those reversals that uh i mean one example was the person who you reverse who's like going to shut everything down, of course. Yeah. Um, any others that stick out in your mind, the even a crazier situation that you're put in, especially you're in someone's home. So it's, it's pretty intimate. Um, yeah. So 
when I was one that comes to mind right off the bat in terms of a reversal was we, I used to do road trips all the time. So like we'd go to like interior BC, like five, six, seven hour road trips, like other towns and cities and kind of go down there. Cause I just love selling outside of Vancouver. It's like, if you can sell, like one of the things like selling in Vancouver is great, but there's enough people. I'm like, I want to go where no one is because like, like that, that, that's just kind of what my, my mentality was. And I went to this town once it was about a 12 hour drive up North in Northern BC. And we get there and it was like freezing cold freezing cold and i'm like this is ridiculous i don't know why i'm up here i'm like this I'm like if i don't make enough money to justify this in the five days that i'm up here i'm never coming to this town or city again ever i get in this one family's house and you could tell the family really didn't care um to, to want to buy the, the product they had like they had uh, high school kids etc and kind of going down that road but i'm still going through the entire process they were open to wanting it and halfway through the presentation i was like Okay, I'm like, I don't want to waste my time. Like, I'd rather just go back to the hotel and just hang out with my friends if you guys are really not going to be interested in buying this. And then just as I'm like taking it away, pulled, doing the takeaway on them, the wife's sister walks into the room and she just come and she just come in and she's like overhearing what we're talking about. And she sits down beside this, the mom that I was originally talking to. And she's like, what is this about? And I'm thinking to myself, and I just, my simple question was, do you have kids? She goes, yeah, I don't know. how many kids? He goes, two. I'm thinking to myself, Perfect. This is my opportunity to take no sale and turn it into two sales. And if I'm going to do this, I'm not selling the sister. I'm not selling the original mom. I'm selling the sister. And then I transitioned the entire conversation, took it away, and just ignored the other family that I was there for in their house. And I'm now talking to the sister and like literally selling the, the going through the entire sales spiel with her. And by the time I got three quarters of the way through the presentation with the sister, the mom and the dad from the family's house that I was originally in, they're like, "Well, if she's going to buy it. We're going to buy it too." And I was like, this couldn't have worked out any better in my favor. And just like, just understanding, but that comes down to once again, like emotional intelligence and like reading your surroundings. Like I would have never known that was a sister until I asked later on and all that stuff. I just like opened up. It's like, she's questioning me. So I'm like, I'm just going to question back. Like, what? like, why are you asking me these questions? And eventually literally ended up leaving. And um, like, I literally jerk and I tell the story all the time to our sales guys, where it's like I literally went into a town and literally almost didn't get a sale and then eventually leaving with two sales. And I would have been worth 13 and a half thousand dollars times two in one night. Amazing. Um, so last question, Ron, I just want to point people towards growrev.com and yeah. what you're working on there. Are there any other places online we should point people towards? Um, the company wise, probably growrev.com right now is the most prevalent. Um, if you really want to follow me and kind of what my journey story is, I do a lot of like personal behind the scenes stuff on my Instagram, Rohan underscore chef. And then my YouTube channel right now, we're resplitting that back up, uh, with a lot of different, like, you know, like kind of like you asking like hard hitting questions and kind of stuff that I've learned over the last 17 years of doing sales and marketing, um, and just open door. So if like, you just want to come and listen and learn YouTube and Instagram, if you want to work with us, growrev.com. So last question is around grow of tell people what you're working on there. Who's ideal for you um, yep. as far as, you know, clients and people reaching out. Uh, yeah. Clientele when it comes to grow .com. So we specialize in paid advertising, um, anything from Facebook, anything on the Google platform, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, native advertising, uh, anything you're looking for where you can spend a dollar and you know get a dollar out essentially on the other end or two, depending on what your offer is. Now, we're not, we're, we're not the type, we're not the best agency if you've never spent any money online. Our goal is someone that spent, you know, 10 to $25,000 a month consistently for three to six months and just stuck and can't get a positive return on ad spend or figure out how to actually scale it to go from that $10,000 to $100,000 a month to eventually start spending a million dollars a month. That's our sweet spot for our clients. So we're known as a scale up guys, not as a startup guys in that, in that world. We do work with startup companies that are heavily backed. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're a small mom and pop shop, if you want me to refer you to people that I trust in the industry, absolutely, please reach out. But I would not be, I would not feel comfortable from an authentic standpoint to work directly with you. Cause I know they would do a better job at helping you get started and then hand it back to us to scale. Are there certain industries that are better than others? Um, we're doing a lot. So obviously, like I said earlier, we came from, we're doing a lot in the event space, direct response, anything in the information coaching world, that's kind of, you know, we've been doing that forever. So that's something that we've built the backbones of our company in, uh, moving heavily back into sporting right now, obviously with arenas opening back up and stuff, it's become a massive demand with Matt's background. It's worked really, really well in our favor. Um, and you know, with typical brick and mortar, we've got insurance companies, mortgage companies, um, big, and then like ones that are looking to scale. And what's really done well since, you know, pre just before the pandemic to now has been SaaS companies. 
we've had uh, SaaS and software companies, you know, everything from apps to digital tech, uh, um, tech widgets, et cetera. And I've had three companies in the last two years that we've worked with now uh, that have exited with, and we were behind the traffic on all of that. So kind of, or broad spectrum, we're, as much as we're niche, we're not really niche because it really comes down to what you want. We build it and we have a team that can facilitate based on that offer. Ron, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out growrev.com. And thanks, everyone. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.